Hi, my name is Sean Bentley. I've been with Desai Solutions since uh, 2006. This uh, presentation, we're going to talk about getting started with SOLIDWORKS simulation. So on the agenda, first we're going to explain what is SOLIDWORKS simulation standard. What is that package? What, what's included in that simulation package? And compare it to Simulation Professional and Simulation Premium. Then next, we'll get into the SOLIDWORKS simulation interface. We'll show you first how to customize the simulation units, make the uh, outputs look a lot cleaner right out of the gate. So we'll spend only a minute or two on that. Then we'll set up our first study, show you some of the typical options you'll go through when you're creating your studies. Then uh, since simulation standard applies mostly to assemblies, uh, we'll take a look at one popular assembly connection, the bolt connector. And uh, finally, we'll run a motion analysis, another tool that's also included with your simulation standard license. And uh, then we'll have a few recommended resources where you can go to learn more. So to begin, uh, what is SOLIDWORKS simulation standard? So to compare this to some tools that maybe uh, you may already be familiar with, these are, these are tools that are included with every single C to SOLIDWORKS. Every C to SOLIDWORKS has Simulation Express and another tool called Basic Motion, which sometimes I like to call Motion Express. So these are sort of free simulation tools included with SOLIDWORKS Standard and SOLIDWORKS Professional. The Simulation Express allows you to run single body part analysis, so no assemblies, only single body parts. And the Basic Motion allows you to do some simple physics uh, calculations where you have models moving around in space and they're able to collide with each other and you're able to apply some simple motors. Now the Simulation Standard will expand the capability of those two tools. So instead of the Sim Express, which was only for single body parts, now the Simulation Standard will give you the ability to run these same types of analyses, but on assemblies. And also the time-based motion allows you to calculate uh, forces on joints and uh, do more complex motor operations and apply forces, m much more than what the basic motion allowed. It also includes a couple other tools for fatigue and uh, trend tracking as well. Now to compare this to some of the other simulation packages that are available, you can further expand the capability with Simulation Professional, where, which gives you uh, vibration frequency analysis, thermal analysis optimization, and even expands the motion capability to event-based. And Simulation Premium, which expands the structural analysis to include uh, nonlinear and dynamic simulation as well. Now, this presentation is going to focus mostly on these couple of tools, the two biggest pieces of the Simulation Standard suite. In essence, what Simulation Standard gives you is the ability to analyze assemblies for stress and deformation, and also analyze some of those same assemblies for their motion dynamics and kinematics, their, the movement of those components and how they contribute to the loading. We're going to jump into the simulation interface next, where I'll show you how to customize some of the out-of-the-box units. Out-of-the-box, the, box, the um, color plots, they're, they're going to look something like this, which um, I'm not a big fan of because you see a lot of scientific notation. Once we're done, we'll we'll clean up this chart so it has um, nice simple units. Instead of using the default newtons per meter square, we'll change it to maybe kilopounds per square inch, KSI. Also pounds instead of newtons, that kind of thing. In order to change some of these options, uh, you'll just need to turn on your simulation add-in, and I'll, I'll show you this in a moment, and we'll go to the options. To begin, you have uh, along your add-ins list here, we have a couple of tools we're going to be using in this uh, presentation, SOLIDWORKS Simulation and also SOLIDWORKS Motion. So I'm going to turn on the SOLIDWORKS Simulation add-in. Once I do this, you'll see the uh, Simulation tab pops up up here in the top, or, or Simulation drop-down menu rather, and also Simulation tab gets added onto the uh, Command Manager. Now, before I go and create a new study, let's change our units. If I go to our simulation drop-down, very close to the bottom, and select Options. Under this Default Options tab, you can sort of customize your simulation template. So here, instead of using the SI units, I'll change it to English. So my displacements will be in things like inches, and the uh, pressures and stresses, let's put those in KSI. 
Then I'll go to color chart and I'll make a few customizations in this region here. First of all, instead of reading scientific notation all day long, I'm going to change this to general. And the uh, stress plots and uh, factor safety plots I'll customize to a specific number of decimal places, bump up all other plots to show five decimals so I can really see thousands of an inch more clearly. And finally down here, instead of uh, default color scale, I'll change this to uh, optimize for color blindness. That'll shrink that big green region there and it gives me more colors along the, the gradient here. So with that we've just customized our template, made it, cleaned it up a little bit for the simulations that we'll be running next. So next uh, what we'll do, we'll show you uh, creating a quick study. To get into this, what we're going to be analyzing is a uh, couple of the components inside the these elliptical workout machines. We have a pulley that has a belt on top of it, and that's being driven by a person moving up and down, uh, and it's causing this, this arm up here to bend potentially. And what I want to do is we're going to analyze this sort of crank arm, the arm that's moving up and down and causing the pulley to rotate. So here's what uh, the model I've got uh, looks like. A person would be moving up and down in here and causing this crank to rotate. Simplified version of what you saw in that previous uh, slide. So the general approach that I'm going to recommend for setting up simulation studies, instead of, say, starting with a complex assembly like what we have here and trying to run a simulation directly on this assembly with all these components and then having to mesh all of that and work with all that can be very it can be very um, tricky or uh, sometimes impractical and usually the pathway to success ends up looking something like this it'll be very hard to reach your goal and you might spend a lot of time to get virtually nowhere and to get almost no results out of a, out of a simulation of that scale so frequently we'll simplify the problem down to just the core components that we're most worried about to start with and we'll run a simulation just in this case just on the crank arm with uh, the loading that I think that's going to be applied to that. Now from here though you can start scaling up your simulation and include more components slowly approaching your goal whatever your goal your outline goal might be and you might t t make some uh, missteps along the way but you can always go back and run a different simulation that hopefully takes you closer to your goal you're learning little bits and pieces with each additional step that you run until eventually after maybe a few steps, you're able to make it there. So we're going to take a very similar approach to that. We'll, again, start pretty simple here with just a couple of components, and then we'll run that one. And then we'll scale it up to a few additional components and run it again, and we'll compare the results that we get from the two, see how similar or maybe different of our results. We'll start with just this set of components. So here's our already fairly simplified assembly, which will take a little further. I'll, I'll be removing a few additional components in a moment here. So to set up a simulation study, it's similar to how you might create a new file in SOLIDWORKS, similar to how you go to File New to create new files. And in the case of simulation, we go to Simulation Study to create new studies. And in this uh, list, you'll see I have uh, Simulation Premium installed on mine, so you can kind of see all the different modules that I can uh, run a simulation on. A lot of these might be grayed out for you depending on which license you have access to. But I think most of you will see static and uh, fatigue at least. But here we'll be creating a static structural study to begin with. Now for the... Uh, we'll walk through this tree here. Uh, pretty much from top to bottom. You can go in whatever order you actually like in this tree, but it makes sense to maybe start at the top and work your way down. The first item in the tree is where we can go to assign materials to these different bodies. Some of them already had materials assigned. You see it has a little green check and it pulled an alloy steel material right from my SOWERX model. In other ones, I maybe neglected to assign the proper material to while I was in the SOWERX CAD environment. So I'll go ahead and apply a material right here. If I right click on items in the tree, it gives me access to the menu. For this uh, crank arm, I'm going to apply alloy steel. And uh, I'll do the same, I guess, with the other crank arm. If I just drag this and drop it onto the other crank arm, it'll copy that material. So now the material is applied to both. Now, uh, I don't actually want to run with 
all the four of these components for our first study though. So what I'm going to do is let me select both of these, the second crank arm and the pulley, and we'll exclude those from our first analysis. Next, uh, we need to take care of the connections between components. Here we still have two bodies and simulation needs to know how they're going to interact with each other. So in the connections folder, if I expand it, I see a global contact set to bonded. You're going to see this in your simulation tree for any multi-body part or assembly that you have. If you have any model file that has two or more bodies in it, it's going to have this global contact bonded in the tree by default. And what that's going to do, it's going to bond together any touching faces between the components, which in this case, the faces between these couple of components do touch. You can verify if faces touch or even overlap using the SOLIDWORKS interference detection tool by turning on this little treat coincidence as interference checkbox and it'll show me the different touching regions. So it looks like it's going to bond together. I'll refresh the uh, hide show characteristics there, but looks like it's going to bond together those uh, couple of faces um, because it looked like according to the interference detection tool those were touching. I won't change anything in the connections folder. I'll leave them the way they are for this first study. Next we'll move down to the fixtures. I'm going to fix this uh, center ring here. And you can see the way that we have this set up, there's, there's actually three faces in here. You see all three of these faces. So in order to be able to split, this used to just be one big face, and we split it up into three faces. In order to split your faces so that you'll be able to apply your loads and your fixtures locally, you'll need to create something called a split line. Okay, So that tool... If I open up one of these parts, you have to be in a part modeling mode. That tool is this tool here, a split line. And the, the way in which it works is you can draw a sketch. For example, here, maybe I'll put a new split line on this model for a moment. Your sketch might look something like this, perhaps. And then if I use this sketch to split this face, I'll go to Insert Curve Split Line. And I'll tell it to project to project our current sketch onto this face. And there you go. So you can see the result of that. All right, so I'm going to delete this new split line, though. Just wanted to show you that tool because it's very important for setting up simulation studies. Very handy tool. So we've already had that, split, that face split up. I've got my fixture on there now. Now we'll apply our load. If I select this face, and now I want the load to be pointed in the negative x direction. So we'll use a selected direction. And simulation, instead of just using global coordinates, a lot of times we'll use reference geometry. So if you have a sketch drawn in the correct direction that you want to apply your load in, or, or if you can use your just your default planes, such as in this case I'll use this plane 3, I can tell the load to go normal to that plane. I'll flip the direction of the arrow over, and I'm expecting to see a load transfer to this face of about 300 pounds when, uh, when this elliptical machine is in operation. All right, so that might be good for our baseline study. I think we're practically ready to run. One more step required here is to mesh the model. If I right-click on mesh and create a mesh, I'll just use a default size here see what we get. And what this does is it effectively breaks up a potentially complicated model into simple shapes, in this case just uh, little triangles. And it's able to add together the results of all these simple shapes to give you the full result on the total, the total shape of your geometry. So now let me go ahead and run this study. If I right click on the study name in the top here, we can find the run button. And the study takes, this simple study takes about two seconds to run. Um, the bonded contact, and it basically assumes that these are all merged together like it's almost a single body part, practically. But you can do multiple materials. So it's very quick to run, a couple seconds. And uh, I get stresses. Uh, maximum stress in this model is reporting about 23, but if I click on this top number, I can customize this scale. And that way I can see a bit more color. Maybe if I try 12 here, yeah, I can get a better sense of roughly what the general stresses are going through this arm. 
and down here they get a bit above 12, of course. Now the yield strength for our material. I've selected alloy steel, and if I take a look at that material in the database, it has a yield strength around 90,000, or in other words, 90 KSI. And we're down at 12. If I plug in 90 here, if I plug in the yield strength in the material, this thing looks pretty safe. Okay, now I'll go back down to 12 again, so that way we can get a better sense of how stress is flowing through this structure. So next what I like to do, I like to scale up our simulation a little bit, run a more complicated version of it and compare the results, see if I get about the same answer, see if it drastically changes things. So I excluded that wheel earlier, the pulley rather, and uh, I also excluded the other crank arm. So we're going to re-include those and see if it makes a difference. If I come down here, here's where it shows me all the studies I've created so far, which is just the one. I can copy this study, give it a new name, and in this second study, I'm going to include those couple of components that I excluded earlier. So if I right-click on each of those and re-include them, and now I'm going to want to move my fixture location because I had that center uh, split surface fixed. I want to move that now. I'm going to edit this. And instead of fixing that little face in the middle, I'm going to fix further away. I'm going to fix this outer rim here. It's where the belt is located. All right, and with that simple change, I'll remesh this new version of my model. I'll just use the same mesh size that I used uh, before and we'll run this study. This one takes a little longer to run. I've included more components, therefore the calculation will have to run on those additional components as well. And if I look at my stress pattern here, I have my, cut, my chart already customized 0 to 12 and it looks about the same to me. It looks like I still see the same kind of color gradients on here, the same kind of red I saw a moment ago. Now, rather than just relying on my memory to tell me if it's the same, um, what I can use is a comparison tool. If I right-click on Stress 1 in the tree here and select Compare Results, this allows me to compare the stresses across the two studies that we ran. And here as well, if I rotate a bit, zoom in on some of these regions, it looks like including the wheel or excluding it didn't make any any real difference to the results here with the excluded wheel we see very similar pattern very similar stresses to when I included it almost practically identical does it make a difference to displacement results if I go to my displacement plot displacements on this one uh, on the one that includes the wheel about 36 thousandths of an inch and if I look at displacements on the original, about 30 thousandths. And that makes sense. The displacements would be bigger on this one that includes the wheel because now I'm actually including the wheel deformation in the calculation. So that additional 6 thousandths is due to the wheel bending or twisting as well. What we just walked through there, we, we walked through two simple studies. Uh, we've started with a a uh, very simplified version of the elliptical machine, just the crank arm um, and the connecting rod. And then we scaled it up to a, uh, a bigger study that included the pulley as well as the other crank arm, and we saw virtually the same results. If we were to keep scaling up more and more, I wonder if our crank arm results would change at all based on these couple of studies that we ran. Next, what I'd like to do I'm going to compare results between our simplified study and one that includes some more detail in this joint. By default, we just assumed these were going to be bonded together, but in reality, they're not, it's not like they're welded together or anything, like, which is what the, essentially what the bonded contact sort of assumes. Like there's some sort of rigid glue or some full penetration weld in there. In reality, there's more of what we would call a sliding contact or no penetration contact between these couple of components. And that can make a big difference locally to the results. So let's show uh, that level of uh, analysis as well. So if I go back to my uh, 
simplified study here, this is the one I'll primarily operate within, we'll make another copy of this and we'll run a more sophisticated version on that uh, joint. So all I'm going to change here, I'll do this in a fairly simple way, I'm going to change our our global contact, which is currently set to bonded, where it's bonding together those touching faces. I'm going to edit this and change it to a no penetration contact. It, lets, it warns me I need to remesh. It doesn't need to line nodes up anymore. So I'll recreate the mesh and let's see what it uh, looks like now. And since I'm going to be analyzing this region more carefully, I don't like the number of elements I have down here. It's too coarse. So what I'm going to do is we're going to refine the mesh in this region, in this local area, so I can get better results in that region. To make it easier to do these refinements, I'm going to hide my current mesh to go back to the model view. And I've created an exploded view. That'll make it easier to select some of those internal faces. Exploded views are very handy in assemblies to be able to get access to some of those in inside regions. And what we'll do next is uh, I'll apply a mesh control. With my mesh control tool I'll select these faces, these three little faces here, and their counterparts on the other component. And I'll use a control size, maybe we'll try 0.05 and we'll see what that looks like in a moment. Also do one more mesh control and I'll, use, I'll select these big faces as well, just to refine that contact region. And I'll use a size that's a bit bigger than the one I used a moment ago, maybe 0.1. So I'll recreate our mesh. All right, and that looks a lot better. I have a few elements across there. I think we will be able to capture the results there a lot more effectively. Now, one other concern I have is um, this model could be unstable. I don't have anything that, that will truly restrict this crank arm from sliding off the shaft in the Z direction. So the simulation I'm about to perform is a little bit risky, but what I could do is add additional constraints to stabilize things. Now, since I've run this one in the past without the additional constraints and it's worked, I'll go ahead and do the same here and spare the, step for, spare the additional step for now. Now, you might recall the bonded version of this ran in about two seconds. This one is already taking about five times longer, six times longer. It's, a, it's much, much longer, many mul several multiples longer than the bonded study. The reason for this is whenever you enable any kind of sliding or no penetration contact, you're now running essentially a nonlinear contact analysis where the software has to perform many iterations in order to figure out the contact forces involved. So it may, it may need to, it's essentially, it may need to run that static study 10, 20 times in little linear steps in order to estimate the final result. So it looks like around uh, 50 seconds. So about rough in the ballpark of 25 times longer in this scenario. Fortunately, the model stayed together. I didn't have, I didn't bump into any errors about this thing sliding off in the Z direction. And looks like uh, we get a result that shows us the stress pattern down here. It's very different than what we had a moment ago. Now you see very large stresses in this region. Looks like they're above 20 at least. If I go all the way up to 40, perhaps and maybe re-explode the view so we can see what's uh, going on inside there. So now you can see the stress is much larger. Before 12, I was struggling to see any kind of red when I was changing this to 12. Now I go up to 40 and I still see some red back here. Now this is still under the yield strength of the material I've selected. Remember the yield strength of the material I'm using is 90. But uh, we could have a fatigue issue where a crack might grow and eventually this, the keyway could fracture. So truly a more accurate model of this would include the keyway um, component as like a separate body. In. But uh, we're, we're starting simple just to get the, a sense of what sort of characteristics you may need to include in your simulations if you want to be precise about uh, 
stress results in local regions. So what I'll do next is uh, I'm going to run a fatigue study to see what that peak stress looks like. And we'll wrap up with, uh, with the results from that study. So finally, as a little bonus here, we're going to add one more study to our equation. Okay. This is also included with simulation standard, the fatigue analysis tool. And with this tool, you'll be able to cycle the load over and over again and then see how many cycles your structure can last and how much damage you may have accumulated. So I'll show you some of the simple steps behind one of this, one of these analyses. The fatigue analysis will de depends on the static studies, the previous static studies that you may have run. So here I'll add an event, and the event is going to pull from the static 3 study that I just ran. And I'll tell it to run 100,000 cycles of that static study. Then the materials, I'll apply fatigue data to all bodies. And here you'd enter in your SN curve. This describes the stress versus number of cycles that the material that you've chosen can last based on a physical test of a uh, test specimen. Now in this case, I don't happen to have a fatigue curve for the alloy steel I've selected, though some materials in the database do include these curves. There's about 50 included uh, with the expanded materiality database that's included with uh, SIM standard. In this case though, I'll just do, I'll do an estimate by deriving the uh, fatigue curve based on the material, the type of material I've selected, which is a steel. So let's try this one out. I'll apply our fatigue curve and now I'll run this study. So the results we come up with will show us damage. If I explode the uh, view. Here we see the damage well exceeds 100%. And also I can see a life plot. The life plot will tell me an estimate of how, how long some of these regions will last. The minimum life it predicts right now is around 1,000 cycles. All right, to summarize what we did there, we um, uh, added some more detail to a local region in this model. Okay, we started with just a simple bonded contact, which was very quick to run. And then we uh, included an open penetration contact, which took, which took quite a while longer to run, but gave us more accurate local results that we could then take into a fatigue study based on the peak stress that we saw in that region. And we saw that uh, the damage factors did exceed 100% on this model. So next what I'd like to do, we're going to move into a uh, different model where we'll take a look at some assembly connections, specifically the bolt connector. The model we'll look at next is a uh, basketball hoop and there's going to be four bolts that we're going to analyze where the, that connects the, the rim to the backboard. The bolt connector tool is very useful for doing a pass or fail check does a sort of a quick hand calculation in the background for you based on the loads that you're applying. Figure out what, uh, what sort of shear loads going through each bolt, what sort of bending moment, and use that information to figure out, yeah, the bolt's good, or no, it's going to fail and it needs attention. So let's try one of these out. So here I have our basketball hoop. It's got four bolts that I wanted to test. The primary load case we'll test here is if somebody's hanging on the end of this thing, we'll put a 300 pound load on this, tugging down on it, and um, see if the bolts hold up. And now notice we didn't model the entirety of the backboard, just a small portion of it, only the region, the local region that we really need to analyze, because where that backboard is supported, it's fixed to some other uh, supports right down here in this region. So we modeled that supported face as another split line, split surface. Now I already have a study that's been partially set up. This study just includes the load and the fixture. And if I run this study by default, it's just going to bond together touching faces. In other words, it'll just bond together the back face of the hoop to the backboard here. It's very quick to run, so 
If I just hit run on it, it takes a couple of seconds, and it's already done. And here, at least in this study, I can get a quick estimate of things like the displacement. Here it tells me the hoop would displace by one inch. And also a general idea of some of the stresses I'm likely to see in some of these hoop connections. I see the stresses with that load on it are pretty significant, but if this person were 300 pounds bouncing up and down, I might be worried. But resting statically on there, uh, this thing looks like it might hold up. Now, let's test the bolts. So what I'd like to do, instead of just bonding together these faces, we're going to apply bolt connectors. If I right click on the connections folder, you can see the options for all the different type or all the different types of connectors that we have available. Here, I'll select bolt. There's several different styles of bolts. I'm going to be using the bolt with a nut. So to begin, if I select this edge, which is where the bolt head would contact, and then for the other, for the next selection, if I select this opposite side edge, that's where the nut will contact. It'll automatically fill out to these next boxes. It adds 50% to the diameter of whatever edge I selected there, which is close enough. Looks pretty good. 0.525 for the head and 0.35 for the shank. I need to turn on, if I want the uh, bolt connector tool to do the pass or fail check, I need to turn on strength data and then tell it how many threads per inch. This will allow it to calculate the, calculate the tensile stress area. Tell it the yield strength of the bolts I'm using, which is 90 KSI, and also a factor safety I'm shooting for, which is 2. And finally, key in a preload torque. In this case, I'll type in 60 pound-inches, which is about 5 foot-pounds of torque. I'll turn on the push pin, since I plan on creating three more of these bolt connectors. So the next one will be between here and here. And on the opposite side, and you can kind of see how I'm clicking through these, you can use some shortcuts to speed up the selections. If I click here, and then if I right click, it'll automatically cycle me down to the next box in my property manager. So I don't need to always go over here and click again, and it's a lot of back and forth. So we can speed this up. And the same here, if I click here, and then right click, it'll be like clicking OK. So from the final bolt, click, right click click, right click. And just like that, I'm done with creating those four bolts. I'll cancel out of this property manager so that they all are in a bolt group folder. You can see a little preview image of them pops up as well. Now, since I don't want it to bond together these couple of faces, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the contact to a no penetration contact. One way we can do that, instead of changing the global contact, we could do this locally as well. If I create an explode view, and maybe hide my stress plot so we can see inside of here. The previews of the bolts look a little funny. Ignore those for now. Whenever you explode the view, the preview symbols get a little funny. But what we'll do is uh, I'm going to override that global contact locally here with a contact set. With a contact set tool, I'll tell it that this face here is not allowed to penetrate through that face there. So we have no penetration between these couple of faces. So that way they are able to slide. The bolts are going to be the only thing keeping them from coming apart completely. So now I'll mesh this model, create a new mesh. And we'll run this study. Now since I've included some no penetration contact here, the runtime will take longer than when I ran it without that contact. Again, you might recall that uh, when I bonded things together on this study, it only took a second or two. But now with the no penetration contact, um, it turns it again into a nonlinear analysis, and it takes a bit longer. Now I get this message. Um, this message is saying that there are large displacements in the model. Okay, this is a very common message, and whenever you get this message, if you weren't expecting to see it, I almost always recommend hitting no to it. That way you'll get a result very quickly, almost instantaneously, and you'll be able to look at that result and ask yourself if it makes sense. Whereas if you 
If your inclination is to hit yes to this message, you might not get any feedback. It might fail to run. You might not get any, any kind of result. It might take a long time to get you no results. So if you're not expecting to see this message initially, please hit no to it initially. I've got more information on that large displacement message uh, written in a blog article and uh, also a video that explains it as well if you're interested. Uh, as soon as I hit no to that message, I get some results. Shows me virtually the same kind of stresses. If I go ahead and collapse the view. So I see the stress plot looks very similar to the way it looked before when I just bonded things together. At least in these regions, I see larger stresses. My displacements, still about one inch. And then if I go to my pin bolt check plot, though, it's a plot you need to create. If you right-click on the results folder, you can create these. If I go to this plot, it shows me that there's two bolts that are okay, shows them in green, and two bolts that need attention, shows those in red. And if I click on some of the bolts that need attention in this little dialog, it tells me that they were close to passing. 1.83 was their calculated factor of safety, and we were shooting for two, remember. If I select details, it'll also bring me to this dialog where I can look at the bolts and see what kind of shear forces were going through the ones that failed compared to the ones that were going that compared to the shear forces that go through the ones that passed. And I can see the ones that failed, they, they had almost twice as big of a shear force going through them. And likely they're, because they're closer to the, the load path, how the load path transfers down to the fixture. So they need, they need to take the brunt of that load. So looks like the, I'm a little worried about these two bolts. Maybe we need to resize them, add a few additional bolts. Uh, what we what did we just do there? We um, simplified a potentially complicated connection, a bolt connection, with just a simple bolt connector element, part of SOWRC simulation standard. And this made it uh, easy to evaluate whether or not some of those bolts would pass or fail. Finally, what we'll look at, another, another feature in simulation standard is SOWRC's motion. Allows you to do motion, dynamic, and kinematic analysis. And the model we'll look at uh, this time be a relatively simple mechanism, a uh, valve uh, opening and closing, where we'll, we'll be testing out uh, different spring stiffnesses. I'd like to make sure that as this cam rotates, that the spring will keep it constantly engaged. We don't want the rocker to come off of the cam as it's rotating. We want to maintain a nice constant contact. So our spring needs to be sized accordingly. You make the spring too soft and it'll be bouncing on top of that cam. You make it too hard and too rigid and then uh, the cam, we're going to need a lot of uh, a big motor to be able to drive that cam. Here's the uh, simple model here. Now, the first step to really creating a good motion study is to have a model that just has the essential mates that you need in it. Here, I've got this cam that's free to pivot, just has one degree of freedom. I've got this rocker, also free to pivot, one degree of freedom. Can't translate or anything side to side. Okay, And also this um, valve, it's able just to slide in and out. Now I'm going to undo a lot of those movements because I like the initial position I had things located in. And now we're going to create a motion study from scratch where I'm going to start off by rotating the cam, then we'll gauge some contact and maybe add the spring last. To begin to create a motion study, you should turn on the SOWRX motion add-in. Once this add-in's been enabled, we can create a new motion analysis study. If you go to the assembly tab, this is one place where you can go to create new motion studies. I'll select this button. Creates the studies down here. You can see I've created a few other studies as well, doing some other tests, but okay, I'll start with this new study here. And uh, what we'll do is I'm going to change the animation to a motion analysis that allow me to look at things like contact force and do a realistic simulation, include spring loads and so on. 
Also, since I don't care about animating things like camera views, changing and rotating, that kind of thing with this study, I'll turn this off. Disable the playback of view keys. I'll create our motor. So a lot of the tools that we're going to use for this, for creating this animation, are pretty much all located right in this vicinity. I'll add a uh, motor to start with. And the motor is going to drive this component. So if I just use this cylindrical face, it'll know to rotate around the axis of that face. I'll flip the direction over, reverse the direction of it, and I want this thing to move pretty quickly, so I'll do a thousand RPM. So now if I test that animation out, I'll use this calculator button to calculate the motion. See it spins pretty uh, smoothly there. Now I don't need to run it for, this is going to take a while if I let it run for the full five seconds it's trying to run for, so I'm going to stop to interrupt the calculation. I'm going to scale the total time back. So if I edit the key point time, I think if I just run this for say 0.12 seconds, that'll show me two full rotations. So there we go. One, two, and that should be enough. Next I need to have the contact modeled here. It's, right now this cam's going right through the rocker and, uh, and therefore the rocker doesn't doesn't actually push the valve. So to add contact, that's also on this toolbar here. I'll select contact. Um, for the selections here, I'm going to select the cam, the rocker, and the valve, all three of them at once. And I don't care too much about friction, so we can speed up the calculations a bit by turning that off. I'll assign a material to all this of steel so that the contacts behave fairly rigidly. And that looks good. Let's test it out though. Let's see what happens. Uh oh. So it looks like it is solving the contact, but oh, we forgot to put the spring in. So let me go back to zero seconds and where everything was initially positioned. And we're going to add a spring element. So with the spring, I'll make a couple selections here between this edge, which the software will use the center point of that circular edge, and maybe this face, which it'll use the centroid of that. And so now you can see this spring element gets created. Now this is just a display. It doesn't actually, the, the spring doesn't look that stiff in reality, perhaps. But here, I'll, I'll adjust the st actual stiffness. I'll start off with a fairly flexible spring and I'll change the free length so it's longer so that way the spring will be in compression initially because this length here is about 45 millimeter and I'm making the spring 60 millimeters long as, as its free length. So now let's test this thing out. If I calculate again looks like it's staying all together. All right, so in order to see if we're making constant contact, I suppose we could zoom in really close in this region and make sure the thing doesn't come apart, or maybe a better way to do that would be to monitor the contact forces. They should make this button bigger here because this is one of the, this is a key button for when you're running motion analyses. It gives you access to all your kind of results and plots. So with this, I'll look at forces, contact force, magnitude, and I'll just select it, any two faces on these couple of components. Those two look fine enough. And while I'm at it, I'll turn on the Show Vector and Graphics window. So once I click OK to that, you can see the contact force plot. And if I play back the animation as well, you can kind of see it flicker across there. But And it looks like our contact force is always positive. It never hits, it never goes down and touches zero. So it looks like even in this region where the contact is a little bit lower, we're still making contact. Okay, and you can see the force also depicted. Looks like there's always an arrow up there, always making contact. All right, now what about if we try this at a faster RPM? Maybe instead of a thousand RPM, I'll go back here and if I double click on this key for the motor, change it to 2000 RPM. Now what happens? So I'm gonna hit calculate again. 
and we'll see it spin around instead of four, two times, it'll spin around four times because it's going twice as fast. And I think I'm seeing an issue. There's there's points where that, that yellow arrow goes away completely. And here in the uh, plot, I might have to adjust the scale this time because our contact force peaks up for some reason. So if I adjust this axis here, scale it to maybe, uh, I don't know, how about 30. Here you can see the contact is positive, goes up, and then drops down to zero for a period. And then it shoots way up because that it comes crashing down, creates a huge collision force for a moment, and then is pretty constant until it does it again and again and again. All right, so it looks like our spring isn't stiff enough. Let's stiffen the spring up a little bit. So I'll edit the spring element. Instead of a 0.1 newton per millimeter, let's bump it up to 10 times that and test it out. If I recalculate, and ah, okay, so far so good. I'm seeing that yellow arrow, arrow, that yellow arrow on there the whole time. And if I look at our contact force, this time since my spring is a lot stiffer, it generates larger contact forces, which means I need to scale this up a bit. Here I see the force, the contact force is this time always positive. It's in the ballpark of about 30 to 40 newtons, somewhere in that range. So what did we do in that simulation? Well, I showed you some of the different tools that are part of the SOLIDWORKS motion. You can use SOLIDWORKS motion to evaluate contact forces in your assemblies, for example. Uh, in this case, we could use it to size the spring. You can use it to size motors, examine joint forces, the forces going transferring through your different joints, and if you're doing any kind of mechanism design. We could have used it on that elliptical machine to figure out that how if a person were standing on the elliptical machine, how much force actually actually does get translated to that crank arm. Very handy tool to use in conjunction with your SOLIDWORKS simulation tool. Finally, to, to wrap up, there's a few other uh, areas where you can go to learn more about SOLIDWORKS simulation. One of the first places you might go is in the help pull down. There's a SOLIDWORKS tutorials section where you can go to find simulation tutorials. You can also go to mysolworks.com. It gives you access to some free training content, some of them in video format. Some of them you'll be able to walk through step by step on screen. We also offer uh, subscription mentoring or consulting sessions. If you're on subscription, you get two free hours of this service per quarter. Feel free to take advantage of that. Shoot us an email. Let us know you're, you're interested in uh, doing a subscription mentoring or a what we also call simulation double check where we have one of our simulation tech technicians log in and double check how you've set things up and maybe give you some guidance and recommendations. And then finally, uh, we have in-classroom training as well. Our simulation essentials class is a three-day course. covers a lot more detail of what I was able to cover in this short session here gives you some good foundations about how to set up and run some of your initial simulations. We do also offer, if you're interested in the motion side of things, there's a separate training class for that. It's a two-day training class. Thank you very much for watching and looking at this uh, presentation.